I do have the program here. It is a little bit water damaged in a couple places, and I honestly can't tell you if that's from the rainstorm after the show or my tears during it. It's just such a powerful show. Oh my god, 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 hey. Welcome back to my theater themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe. I'm obsessed with all things theater. I'm a critic, I'm a pundit, I make YouTube videos. We don't have time for any of that because I am so excited to bring you today's video. Because this is a YouTube video 15 years in the making. Well, actually, that's a lie. Because I haven't been making YouTube videos for 15 years, nor was I planning to 15 years ago. However, this has been a theater trip 15 years in the making because I have been waiting for this show to come to the UK for exactly that long. Yes, a few days ago, I I went to go and see the long-awaited UK premiere of the musical Next to Normal, which is currently playing at the Donmar Warehouse. This is a show that when it first appeared on Broadway won the Pulitzer Prize for drama, something that few musicals have been able to attain, and it also developed a cult following. Now, a decade and a half later, London audiences are finally getting to see this show for themselves, but does this new production live up to the strength of the original? And how does the original London cast compare? I'm going to be answering both of those questions and so many more in today's video. Rarely will I make notes, and in the interval of this show, I had so many specific thoughts, primarily about the staging, that I made pages and pages of notes uh, on my phone. So you have this to look forward to. Now, if you enjoyed today's review, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming soon. I have so many to release this week, it's very exciting. And if you're just meeting me now, I've been posting so many theatre-themed videos recently. Go and check out some of the stuff that I've reviewed before, as well as interviews, theatre trips, and lots more stagey content. Also, if you have been to see Next to Normal already at the Donmar Warehouse, or if you have seen a previous production of the show before, comment below with your thoughts about it. Now, if I can contain myself, let's talk about Next to Normal at the Donmar Warehouse. So Next to Normal was a 2008 rock musical written by Tom Kitt, who composed the songs, and Brian Yorkey, who wrote the lyrics and the book. And it's all about Diana Goodman and her family. She's been diagnosed prior to the events of the show with bipolar disorder, and she's experiencing a complex array of symptoms based on that. What the show depicts is how this impacts her family, as well as the complexities and shortcomings of trying to treat a condition like this. It deals with some obviously very heavy themes like mental health, and grief, and suicide, and depression, and drug abuse, as well as touching on some really interesting things like medicating mental illness, like ethics in modern psychiatry. There's so much to say about this show and its themes and I don't think I can really tell you fully about this production without talking through a fairly major spoiler. So if you don't want to know what happens in this production, if you haven't seen it before, I would encourage you not to watch any further in this video. Go and see the show, come back to me, and then we can talk about it. But for those of you who do know what happens in this show or who don't care about spoilers, this is what happens. So at the beginning of the show, we meet this pretty stereotypical looking family unit. We meet Diana, the mother, her surly teenage son who has broken his curfew, her daughter who is stressed by trying to balance all of her academic commitments and her workload with worrying about what's going on at home, that being an anxiety that we don't really understand yet, but oh we will. Similarly, Diana's husband Dan is characterized with a visible nervousness that again we don't really understand. That is until her daughter Natalie meets a boy while practicing for her upcoming piano recital, and when he ends up unexpectedly invited to her home to meet her parents, Diana brings out a birthday cake to celebrate her son's 18th birthday. However, Natalie's boyfriend Henry and the audience find out together in that same moment that the son doesn't actually exist because he died as a baby. So what we've been seeing on stage is Diana's hallucination that we as the audience have been party to, but in that time he hasn't actually interacted with any of the other family members, only with Diana. It's at this point that we begin to understand the severity of Diana's condition, and this kind of instigates the rest of the plot. As she begins to receive progressively more radical and more extreme treatments, Natalie is becoming more and more anxious and is stealing her mother's depression medication in order to try and calm herself, but is clearly beginning to abuse this and spiral out of control herself. Father and husband Dan, meanwhile, is so busy caring for his wife and trying to do the right thing by her that we don't even come to find out about all of his 
grief until much later in the show, but it's a really thrilling and brilliant piece of theatre. To say that this happened so many years before Dear Evan Hansen, which is credited as having opened up the conversation about mental health, I think this does just as much to talk about mental health, but while Dear Evan Hansen has a much more juvenile and adolescent version of that conversation, where they just try and impart the message, an important message to young people, but a juvenile message that, like, you might feel alone, but everything's going to be okay, and we don't sort of move that far past that. Next to Normal really wades into the meat of the mental health conversation. It talks about how the mental health of parents ends up affecting children, how those individuals had been affected as children by their parents. It talks about the impact that mental health can have on an entire family unit. It talks about the shortcomings of treatment of mental health. It's incredibly critical of a lot of those practices, of shock therapy and of inexact pharmaceutical treatments. And as well as providing a really biting and bold exploration of all of those ideas, it has such a perfect score. By which I mean a score whose edgy rock and roll style is so perfectly suited to the characters that it's depicting. It's edgy, it's thrilling, it's dynamic. When Diana starts receiving shock therapy at the start of the second act, we kick into this really rocky gear. You have these lyrics where all of these characters are singing circles around all of their emotions because they're all anxious and neurotic and overthinking. And if we think about Diana as being the central character of this show, the music so often reflects her sensibility. You have a song like I Miss the Mountains that is comparatively more sedate and laid back because she's medicated and suppressing the extremes of her emotions. Something like I Dreamed a Dance is haunting and bewitching as she's becoming entranced by her own harrowing delusions. And then something like Didn't I See This Movie in the second act is angry and edgy and rock and roll and powerful because she's having this volatile reaction to the treatment that's been suggested for her. There are so many profound and powerful turns of phrase in this show. These are all such real and established characters who explode into each other at every turn. It's a wonderfully written piece of theatre. However, did I think that this production stood up to the acclaimed original? So this production has been directed by Michael Longhurst, with additional direction and movement direction and choreography by Anne Yi. Nick Barstow is the musical director, while Nigel Lilly is the music supervisor. So I want to talk about what I really enjoyed with this new production by Michael Longhurst. Let me tell you a little bit about what it looks like. We have this modern, sleek, pretty expensive looking house setup split over two levels. Most of the action takes place on the lower level of this set that has a kitchen island and a revolve and a few other pieces of scenery. On the upper level, we have the band who are split between a few different rooms behind screens with blinds that can come down in front of them. We have projections appearing onto those blinds. And I think as a design, it's pretty cold and clinical. It gives you this sort of very straightforward looking suburban thing, which is a lot of what we want at the beginning of this show. We have what appears to be a very ordinary family and it's only after we delve beneath the surface that we come to find out everything is not as it appears to be. So certainly I'm very on board with the production of Next to Normal where this environment looks very traditional to begin with. It could probably have a little bit more warmth and personality. It very much does just look like a plain Ikea showroom. In fact, no, Ikea showrooms have far more personality. This looks like the Ikea showroom before they decorate it. What's clever is that everything is staged from this context, and so the kitchen island that Diana is preparing the family meal on becomes the same hospital bed that she is lying on with her feet either side of the sink while she's receiving treatment in the second act. And that puts everything that happens in the context of being about this family unit. It's not a show just about her as an individual anymore, it's about the home and the family who live there. Because when you talk about everything that a family is experiencing and people on the outside not knowing what's going on behind closed doors, we don't always mean that geographically. Not all of that takes place in the home, but it's something that affects the home, if you know what I mean. I will also quickly say I love the way that that kitchen island can get stowed at the back of the stage and they have this other work surface that retreats to allow it to go into its place. Ikea wishes they had storage solutions like that. That was fantastic. Who did this set design? Chloe Lamford. Chloe Lamford is the designer on this production. There you go. I bet they've got an amazing kitchen. I have mixed feelings about seeing musicians on stage unless there's really a reason for it. And I think what we're meant to be seeing here is the world as experienced through Diana's perspective. And there's a moment in the first act where she meets a new doctor, Dr. Madden and uh, she goes between hearing him speak normally and hearing him speak 
as if he is a rock star and he's singing to her and she's hallucinating and experiencing the world through this rock music filter. And so the band being visible on stage is all a part of that as well. Added to that, after we find out that her son is not actually real, but is only this apparition that she's seeing as a result of her condition and of her lingering grief, he gets to sing this song called I'm Alive and they give him a handheld microphone to do this. That I think is very clever. I don't know if everyone will necessarily be on board with that choice because arguably it makes it all feel a little bit less real. But again, it's through that filter of psychosis she's experiencing the world via a rock musical, which is a great way of articulating the emotional extremes that she's feeling. And the moment that he appears on stage holding the microphone singing I'm Alive, it justifies us being able to see the band. Now I mentioned the projections. Some of these appear on the blinds. There's one bit of clever projection mapping on the floor uh, where it just shows everything except the revolve in the center. And this is decent. I would never blew me away with what they achieved using projections, but I think it establishes atmosphere pretty well, and it adds on another layer of separation from reality. As though we are walking in step with Diana and moving slightly further into delusion and hallucination because everything is starting to look slightly warped. Speaking of the Revolve, I love the Revolve. I can't think whether the original Broadway production actually had a Revolve, and I now think every production of Next Normal should always feature one. There are lyrics in the first song when she's singing, the world just keeps on spinning, and she says, I think the house is spinning, and this idea of this ordinary suburban kitchen slowly beginning to spin out of control and she's the only one spinning and her family are all standing stationary wondering why she's spinning around in circles. That's so completely next to normal. It's such a brilliantly obvious piece of staging. Just wonderful. It's used very effectively in depicting her therapy sessions with various doctors throughout the show, slowly rotating around. There's a moment where Trevor Dion Nicholas as one of the doctors is stood behind her and she's in a wheelie chair like the one I'm in now and he's just slowly turning it so that she remains end on but the floor is rotating beneath her and he's holding her in place. Again, so much metaphorical value to the meaning of all of these staging choices. And then as we begin to approach the end of the first act, something brilliant happens because when you make these kind of metaphorical abstract staging choices, you have the opportunity to snap the audience back into reality with you with something visceral and painful and abrupt. And that's exactly what happens here. This is another significant spoiler. So Diana has been instructed by her doctor to try and get rid of the stuff that she is keeping from her son who died when he was a child. And she takes out the box as she discovers a music box. And that begins a song, a song in which she sees once again, this vision of her her son and he walks down. He has a backpack on as though he's getting ready to leave because she's trying to expel the memory of him and she's trying to move past it all emotionally. And he kind of looks like a teenager who's about to be kicked out of the house. That's a brilliant directing choice there. Instead, he walks down the stairs, he begins to dance with her. And what is implied by this is that this is representing a massive relapse that we come to find out is actually a suicide attempt. The way this is depicted is a pool of blood begins to spill out around the boxes where his childhood things were being stored. Nobody has stood near the boxes at this point. It just pools blood. It's shocking. And that's the perfect way to snap us back into reality after all of the abstract staging that's been happening before that. I think my favorite part of the entire show may have been the last 10 minutes. I thought the last 10 minutes were just extraordinary. So after a treatment at the beginning of the second act causes Diana a huge amount of memory loss, her husband Dan makes the decision to try and remind her of their life together, but doesn't tell her about their lost son straight away. She comes to find out about this on her own and she's going through boxes and boxes of memories, trying to piece it all together and trying to unearth that missing thing that she hasn't been told about because it's been kept from her. And so all of these artifacts of her life are strewn all across the stage. Then out of this chaos comes a moment of such clarity, this sense of betrayal focuses her more so than she's been for the rest of the show. And it allows her to have a very honest conversation with her daughter, Natalie, and they connect more so in that moment than perhaps they ever had. We see her encouraging Natalie to go and be with Henry, her boyfriend, and enjoy the dance at their school. There's a balloon drop that happens. And just this idea of chaos on top of chaos 
stacking towards the end of the show is so real and is such a visual metaphor for the chaos of life, especially one like this. The revolve is spinning, Diana's husband is hunched with his head in his knees on one side of the kitchen island, on the other side is her son in almost exactly the same position. There's a mirroring between them, there's a mirroring between her and her daughter. So much cleverness is happening in the last 10 minutes of this show. The precision of this directing has been astonishing in that part. That being said, I don't know if the same attention to detail existed throughout the production as was present in the last 10 minutes. So let me tell you about the things in this production I did not enjoy as much. To give some big picture criticisms, there was an interview that original Broadway actress Alice Ripley, who won a Tony Award for her performance, gave once where she described the tone of this show, especially in its early scenes, as being a hybrid between Family Guy and Long Day's Journey Into Night. There's a twisted black comedy to it that I'm not sure Michael Longhurst really gets or necessarily leans all the way into with this production. And I can understand the reluctance because this is a serious and harrowing and mature show about mental health, but it's there in the material. There is a humor there. And the characters as portrayed and depicted here are sarcastically funny on occasion, but we don't lean all the way into the laughs that we could be getting. And if it was directed with a slightly more lighthearted tone at the beginning, some of the revelations that we're then met with would perhaps be even more shocking and even more staggering. The more comfortable the false sense of security you lull your audience into, the more jarring it is when they find out that what they've been looking at isn't actually true. But if you just keep hinting and hinting and hinting that something is not quite right here, it's not going to come as as much of a surprise. So a handful of thoughts that I had about this show. The band being at the top, like I said, I like that they are visible. I wish they were louder. I could faintly hear an acoustic guitar and my seats were right next to the band as well. And this is a rock musical. I wanted it to be punchier and more dynamic. I wanted to feel it in my heart. And I really wasn't feeling that. It became a soft rock musical, which doesn't have the same impact. I would say both the band and the vocals were probably too quiet. And I'm not sure if the Donmar Warehouse is the perfect venue for a show like this, for a score of this kind. I will also say space is obviously limited in this very intimate venue. It was a little bit anxiety inducing watching the actors on the top level, trying to awkwardly walk around the band and retrieve things to, to place and trying to move around. It just seemed to be getting very crowded at that top level. And then we had a lot of space that wasn't always used on the lower level. There were a lot of scenes that felt needlessly static, something like, didn't I see this movie? Casey Levy is going for it vocally, but there just isn't enough movement around the stage. She's just sort of slowly walking up to Trevor Dion Nicholas's character. This was another quality I was missing in Michael Longhurst's direction. I wanted it to be a little more manic. I wanted it to be a little more frenzied. I wanted more chaos. We got that at the end. We got a sort of a visual chaos, but a lot of stillness from the performers. I just, no one is running. No one is rushing. There is no urgency to any of it. And because of that, I think subconsciously it started to feel a little more low stakes than I wanted it to. There's a handful of things from the Broadway production that weren't carried over to this one. During I Miss the Mountains at the climax of the song, Diana would previously start discarding all of her medicine, uh, representing that she's making the choice for herself, that she would rather feel her emotions and she would rather be passionate than uh, living this sort of suppressed existence. In this version, she gets all the way through the song before she starts to do that and it's not really as powerful because then it remains to be seen what the climax of the song is actually about other than her feeling this stirring emotion. If she's just standing up and not doing anything with those feelings, then the only conclusion is that she's feeling this surge of emotion. And the whole idea is that she's not meant to be feeling those surges of emotion while she is on that medication. So that doesn't make sense to me. There's a song in the first act called You Don't Know, which is one of the first really open confrontations between Diana and her husband, Dan. And this has been staged before with a brilliant sort of a danger to it and a tension and a threat. And it had Alice Ripley grabbing at knives and not knowing what she wants to do with them. And Casey Levy in this one, while she is singing at her husband, she's cleaning away the meal that she's just prepared and putting things in the sink. And uh, visually, if you weren't to know the context of these characters, it would just look like a very everyday argument between a husband and wife. There's no sense of the power struggle here or that he needs to take care of her or protect her from herself, something that ends up being 
dangerously true by the end of the first act, it just looks like they're having a, a pretty regular argument. Whether that's a choice to show her as a woman much more in control of her own life than everyone seems to think, I don't know, but that seems not to align with the material. There's one moment earlier in the first act where Diana is singing about her psychopharmacologist and all of the drugs that he has prescribed her, and all of the other cast members appear wearing white lab coats and singing the names of different medications. It's a bit of a parody of My Favourite Things from The Sound of Music. That's a cute moment. It's not really consistent with the rest of the show because we don't get that kind of abstract multi-rolling from those performers for the rest of the show. And what I really don't like is that we then cut to scenes in the midst of that between Natalie and Henry, where they are still wearing the white lab coats that they were wearing to play fantasy doctors. And they just kind of take them off of their shoulders. That looks clumsy and messy to me. We need a better way to discard the lab coats. I also am gonna come back again to this twist moment that happens in the first act. It's the moment where Diana brings out a birthday cake and we only know that something is wrong by the reaction of the other characters, by how horrified they look that she's bringing out this birthday cake. She has no idea and she is delighted, but we slowly come to find out as the audience that something is very wrong here. This kind of happens a little too quickly. I would like for there to be more gravitas to this, something more intense in the lighting. There's a little bit of a shift. I just want it to be more pronounced. This is such a powerful turning point in the show. I think so much attention should be paid to the way that this is staged. And I feel like it's just staged in a pretty traditional way. She just walks out with the cake, puts it down, and they just play the scene. Then, and I'm going to be very particular about this because I get very particular about ghost rules. So it's at this moment that we find out that Diana's son, who we later learn is named Gabriel, by the way, he is not really there. So we see him in a very different light all of a sudden when he appears in this scene after they explain why the birthday cake thing is so upsetting. We see him and we can tell from his face uh, that he is not who we thought he was. But what happens is he then walks down and he carries off the birthday cake at the end of this scene. Whether we're meant to notice him carrying off the birthday cake, I don't know. He blows out the candles. That I think is genius, him walking on and blowing out the candles because it's his birthday. Should the candles stay lit because he's a ghost? I don't know. Certainly, I don't like him carrying off the cake because he can't pick up the cake with his ghost hands. They've done so well in the first few scenes not to draw attention to the fact that no one else is seeing him, but to not allow him to do anything or to have any kind of presence in the world or affect anything beyond having conversations with his mother, who is the only person who can see him because he is a ghost. Ghost hands can't pick up birthday cakes. I'm, I'm very particular about this. But most of my thoughts to do with this show are about the performances. So let's talk about this cast. So let's talk about Casey Levy as Diana Goodman. Casey is a Broadway actress who has performed before in Hair, was the original Elsa in the Broadway production of Frozen. She was recently seen in Leopoldstadt. She may be best known to West End audiences for having originated the role of Molly in Ghost. And there's a lot of similarity, especially between act two Diana Goodman with Molly in Ghost. And Casey Levy does that thing very well, that sort of a steely-eyed, glazed over, staring into the middle distance and singing about her despair thing. She does that beautifully. What seems to be a little less readily at her fingertips is the mania of the first few scenes. And again, like everyone else, she has this wonderful, sarcastic, caustic wit, and she is warm, if not particularly vivacious. And I think this has a lot to do with Casey Levy's style as a performer. She is quite subtle and quite measured. She has this wonderful thing with her voice where it sounds very beautiful, almost folky, very relaxed, and then it shifts into this louder, rocky gear. We've heard that before in the cast recordings of Ghost and the revival cast recording of Hair. And there are a couple of brilliant moments in this show where she is almost screaming this score out and it sounds fantastic, but it's that same kind of energy that I want in her acting performance at the beginning. I just feel like without the mania, it's not manic depression. It's just sad vibes. I thought this in her I Miss the Mountains as well. The whole thing was a little bit too laid back for me. We got a climax. I just wanted more from it. And the beautiful fluid riffing that she was doing at the end, I don't know if that's a little bit contrary to the message of the song. Like I said before, if at this point in the show as a character she's meant to be repressed and sedated and inexpressive, then her doing beautiful fluid riffing feels contrary to that. All of this being said, I think every single choice she makes in the second act is perfect. All of the physicality, all of the character choices, her delivery of everything, act two, 
just about perfect. Opposite her, the wonderful Jamie Parker. He's such a terrific actor. I don't know if he necessarily has the kind of a rock tenor voice that makes the score feel completely comfortable when he is singing it, but he navigates the score in a way that works for him, and it's his acting choices that really pay off. His optimistic enthusiasm at the beginning, ultimately the heartbreak that we see by the end, the relationship between Casey and Jamie Parker, also completely believable with a sort of a awkwardness that lingers in their relationship, but the way that she falls instinctively into his arms at the end of Didn't I See This Movie, heartbreaking, so emotional. And then when he performs, I think the song after that is called Light in the Dark, where he's trying to reassure her afterwards and trying to convince her to agree to this treatment that she doesn't really want to, that she is nervous about. The gentleness with which he performs that, it's so stirring it's so beautiful. I think that's one of the first really great moments in the show. The single most emotive moment of this entire show for me comes when Diana has decided, and again, massive spoilers, massive, massive Act 2 spoilers, uh, for her own well-being, she has decided to leave. She leaves him sat alone in the house in the dark, and he's agonizing over the fact that the ghost of Gabriel, their son, hasn't left with her. We find out in that moment that even though we didn't think so up until this point, he can see Gabriel as well. And Gabriel goes over to him and we learn Gabriel's name for the first time because he turns and tearfully says, Gabe, I was sobbing at this point. It was so, so moving. The way he delivered those lines of just saying Gabe's name to him, I have scarcely believed grief quite so much because I have never seen it or despair played so convincingly devastatingly. Speaking of Gabe, Jack Wolf is a complete star in this role. He is exceptional. And I love the way he sings this score. It's not with the bravado and confidence of someone who's about to go and play Fiero in Wicked. There's a trembling vibrato there and a nimbleness that feels very youthful. His characterization doesn't shift too wildly throughout, but it's the subtleties of his intentions in each scene. Like I said before, when we see him preparing to leave with his backpack on, and there's a pain behind his eyes, but then a sort of a quiet malice in the way that he's then leading his mother towards what we find out was a suicide attempt. There's a moment where he appears unseen in between Natalie and her father. They're having an argument. He's passing the microphone between the two of them and it's playful and it's malevolent and it's wonderful. I do think that he could be directed with slightly more purpose because he's a brilliant force to utilize within the show because of what he represents. He becomes the embodiment of Diana's delusions and of her illness and of her condition. But the moment in the second act where the memory of him is stirring and we see his silhouette and a handprint appearing behind a white blind on the upper level of the stage, hauntingly powerful. So, so good. Similarly, just about perfect is Eleanor Worthington Cox as Natalie. She is a wonderful young actress. I thoroughly enjoyed her in To Kill a Mockingbird and The Secret Life of Bees. I think she's a singularly passionate performer. And the two of them read so convincingly as siblings. This show has been phenomenally well cast because it feels like such a believable family unit. It feels a little more up to date, in fact. It feels more 2023. A lot of people thought that Casey Levy was quite young for this role when her casting was announced, but I think she looks more like how a 40 year old old would look now than how they might have in 2008, and Eleanor Worthington Cox looks so much like her daughter as well. The scene between the two of them at the end of the show, they're just such a believable pair, and that's played with such agonizing brilliance. Casey is trying to reach out to her and literally trying to embrace her, and she's pushing her away. It's painful, and it's heartbreaking, and it's wonderfully performed. I didn't even have too many specificities I can offer you here, because just about every choice that Eleanor Worthington Cox makes is brilliant. Her anxiety and her fears and her worries bubble so close to the surface that they effervesce off of her. Her interactions with everyone, her rage towards her father, this misplaced rage, and her resentment towards her mother and her reluctance to embark on this relationship with Henry, her jealousy of this brother that she never knew who was dead before she was born. She plays the detail of all of that spectacularly well. So those four performers do the heavy lifting in the show, but there are two more who complete the cast. Trevor Dion Nicholas plays two different doctors, Dr. Fine and Dr. Madden, the latter of which we see alternately through Diana's delusion as this rock star, and then as a very regular psychiatrist. He's more believable as the very regular man than he is as the rock star. He's not fully like rock tenor believable, but then it feels more like a snapback to reality 
when we see him being a normal guy and he feels a bit more like a fish out of water when depicted as a rock star. So I guess that's probably the better way around for it to be. There's also the littlest bit of a disconnect in between when he is speaking and when he's singing. I believe him utterly when he is speaking, but whenever he is singing, I'm just very aware of the fact that he is singing. It feels a little less genuine because there's a slight veneer of performance about it. So much is articulated through the music of this show and through the lyrics, and it's just that little bit oversung. Jack Africio plays Natalie's boyfriend, Henry. He doesn't have an awful lot to do in this show, and I think he would need to bring more of his own characterization to it that doesn't really exist within the material, because within the context of this show, all he really is is someone who cares a lot about Natalie and is constantly running towards her and trying to grab her and trying to protect her from herself. But it doesn't tell us an awful lot about Henry. We find out that he is a stoner at the beginning, but that side of him very quickly pales by contrast because everything else that's going on and all of the other drug abuse that we get to see in the show is so much more extreme. I think there's room for Jack to bring a little more detail to this characterization, but he does an admirably good job with the material that he has. It's endearing enough and it's sweet enough and he does the job. But those have been my thoughts about Next to Normal at the Donmar Warehouse. It is enduringly a powerful, brilliant, affecting show. And even with any of the shortcomings that I perceived, I think this probably is pretty perfectly cast. It's a wonderful central quartet that they have playing this dysfunctional family. I don't know if the staging of this version is quite as thrilling, quite as compelling, quite as perfect as the original version might have been, but it's material and it's performances that are going to move you and enthrall you and devastate you nonetheless. Thank you so much for watching today's review of Next to Normal. I hope that you've enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming very soon. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>